way you operate or the way your in-group operates provides incentives for other people in how they relate to you. If the way you, you conduct your life right, is such that other people would be better off without you, right, you're incentivizing all sorts of negative behavior against you. And if the way that your group conducts itself makes it so that other groups would be better off without your group in their midst, right? How long can you expect people to show this level of forbearance if, uh, if your group, say, is committing an astronomical amount of crime or is consuming, say, an astronomical amount of government social services without an equivalent level of uh, contributing back through the, the tax base, right? We should be building lives both as individuals and as groups that are a blessing to the people around us. Otherwise, you're incentivizing other people to pull the plug on you. And there are many different ways to pull the plug on an individual or a group. The same way he would be humiliated to see what he has become. This is not what he would want. It's not, this is not the kind of life. I mean, he, if he had his right sense, he would say, why didn't you just let me go three years ago? Why did you keep me alive? And I listened to your last caller and it breaks my heart, the loss. That she- okay, I think that's, that's enough. Uh, <laughs> the chat's getting depressed. Just absolutely horrific story. All right, I want to go back to talking about the Republican brain. Chris Mooney is the author of this new book from 11 years ago, The Republican Brain, and use it to decode one of my favorite podcasts, Decoding the Gurus. Is that we could use our minds, we could use the new institution of science from the 17th century, we could use it to answer these difficult questions and to do social policy better. In that sense, I'm, I'm an Enlightenment. I'm a big fan of the Enlightenment, and I think this new work is part of the Enlightenment project. What it says, paradoxically, is that if you think that reason, individual reason, is the way forward, well, then you're wrong. And so for 300 years, the project has been barking up the wrong tree. Because we're all so crippled by the confirmation bias, because we all as individuals... Wait, confirmation biases. Basically, we use our reason just to confirm what we already right, believe. Right. If that's true, all of us, then I think we all have to get a little more humble as individuals, recognize that as individuals we're not very good at finding the truth, that we only can find the truth when we're put into relationships in which other people can question our confirmation bias, and this is what has changed. Science works because each of us individually flawed scientists challenge each other. And so, so as Chris says, over time the scientific community does update, whereas say the religious right may not. I, I, okay. Yeah, so I, I agree with all of that. Reasons a weak read compared to the power of genetics and the power of imprinting and the power of incentives. I also agree that we reason much better when we reason collectively rather than just, you know, in, in our own heads. So decoding the gurus, right? A couple of center left academics, Chris Cavanaugh and Matt Brown have a podcast decoding the gurus. I think they're generally on pretty sound ground, but they do have their own subjective partisan left wing hero system, right, that condemns what they call racism, bigotry, xenophobia, Islamophobia, homophobia, and the like. And while they talk as though that these condemnations are just based on universal truths, easily accessible by by reason to all, rather they are subjective hero systems, just like the the Orthodox Jewish way of uh, looking at the world is a subjective hero system and the orthodox christian way of looking at the world is a subjective hero system right uh, secular liberals have their own subjective hero system so how do you play the game among elites among our elite institutions which are dominated by the left how do you play the game in academia right you play the game according to its rules right this is usually going to do more for your success than merit or groundbreaking scholarship and so what are the rules right but the, the rules are that you regard yourselves, the liberal left enlightened ones, as guardians of reason, guardians of enlightenment, that you're not really implementing a sectarian agenda based on a subjective hero system. No, you're fighting for universalist virtues like objectivity, inclusivity, diversity, benevolence. Now, conservatives charge that this is just an aura of superior virtue, and I'm borrowing here from the analysis of philosopher Ronnie Goodman, they, conservatives will point out this is a sophisticated social illusion, that it is a dishonest secular facade for a moralistic and quasi-religious impulse, right? A hidden will to power that seeks only to uphold one parochial subjective hero system and social identity at the expense of its rivals. So thinking about one friend of mine who had a tenured faculty position, then he nonetheless lost his job when his pseudonymous and disturbing to most people, social media comments about Jews, right, were revealed to his dean through an email. So getting dubbed on 
to your community, to your spouse, to your family, to your boss, right? It's going to be near the top of concerns for most people. And getting dubbed on to your dean is going to be about the top concern for most academics, including Matt Brown and Chris Kavanaugh. They admitted as much in a Patreon video that I played on one of my shows in late December 2022 or early January 2023. So to have a nice life, academics like uh, Brown and Kavanaugh, along with the rest of us, we tend to shy away from saying things that could get us in hot water with the people who are most important to us, unless we have a disabling level of narcissism that must receive attention at all costs, which is something that I have frequently suffered from. Uh, one thing I've learned from interviewing thousands of people is that everybody's vulnerable. Right? Everybody has their weak points. We're all accountable to someone. Now, decoding the gurus, right? they talk a great deal about epistemic considerations. Epistemology is the study of how do we know what we know. And so they see themselves as coming primarily from a place of truth. But a big part of the motivation for operating from this place of epistemic considerations resides, in the words of philosopher Charles Taylor, in the prestige and admiration surrounding the whole scientific stance itself with the sense of freedom, power, control, invulnerability, dignity that it radiates, right? All the virtues of the buffered, autonomous, strategic, you know, rational identity that is encouraged by this modern transformation of what were Protestant impulses in, in an entirely secular, you know, left-wing direction. So the easiest way to approach the world for an academic today is to wrap yourself in the mantle of science, right? And get that sense of freedom, power, control, invulnerability, and dignity that it radiates as long as the decoding the gurus can wrap itself in science, then they can feel relatively invulnerable to cancellation. They can feel dignified, in control, and free. Now, a problem with this is much of what is considered true, much of what is considered expertise by our elite, is a game, right? Where you play the game of expertise which is getting hailed by your peers as an expert by jumping through a credentialing process. Right? Much of education is learning to be educated in the process of getting an education. Right? Becoming an expert means that you secure the approval of your peers and they sign off on your credentials as an expert. So every professional in particular primarily wants the approval of his peers, and this desire for social approval of his peers is far more incentivized than the pursuit of truth. Right? You can't expect anyone to understand something if their income, their happiness, and their social status depends upon not understanding some obvious truth, such as uh, group differences. So when almost all of our institutions are dominated by the left, particularly in academia and media and culture, Right, when the left controls the cultural means of production, it makes perfect sense for non-leftists to have a knee-jerk suspicion of the establishment. Right, when the left controls the cultural means of production, right, there's going to be a knee-jerk response that you know, public discussion controlled by these institutions is a sham. It's an illusion. It is an instrument of authority, not its basis, as Stephen Turner noted in 1989. So when the left largely decides what are the real issues and who are the real experts, it makes sense for those not on the left to rebel and to express considerable skepticism about university-appointed elites. Let me play a bit more here from Jonathan Haidt talking with Chris Mooney. Uh, Chris, this one is aimed probably mostly at you, but I'd like to know the take of both of you on this. This idea of it, there being a conservative personality. A few years ago, I yeah, you're, you're... proposed, and it was on blogging heads, I'm very interested in evolution, I love biology, and I've always wondered whether natural selection explained everything. I do not believe in God, I'm not interested in intelligent design, but I read a book by Michael Behe that was saying that when it gets to how evolution creates large jumps and steps as opposed to small things, it seems like there must be some other mechanism, we don't know what it is, Michael Behe thought that it was about God, I was thinking, I wonder what... Yeah, the liberal left elite love evolution, except the part of evolution ongoing over the past 10,000 years, evolution producing different groups with different gifts because different groups have evolved in very different circumstances. And they don't like to talk about evolutionary effects on different group metrics with regard to things like you know, cognitive powers and personality traits. 
this other thing might be. I found it fascinating. I contacted him. We did a blogging heads debate. I had a new one, several new ones torn out of me oh, by the blogging surprised. heads community. Mm. The liberal scientists thought that I was the worst thing people write. I've never seen someone so high fall so low so quickly. <laughs> and all of this was the kind of behavior that is associated with conservatives. There's a circling of the wagons, not reason, because I was trying to make sense. I wasn't making a godly argument. That happened. It's over. But it leads me to think <laughs> that this is perhaps human behavior. How do we fit in that even with evolution, the facts are not always as clear completely as we're told and that if you dare to question this, if you but dare to say anything about it in public, the scientific community is really, that's intelligent design. I mean, the scientific community is extraordinarily strongly rejected that. Right. And if they get a little upset when you bring it up, it's because it's a direct right. assault to their science. Okay, so let's go back to the Garometer. All right, a way of assessing the gurus as composed by these two center-left academics, Chris Kavanaugh and Matt Brown. So it notes that a cult will generally have more than a few bones to pick with supposedly nefarious forces in the outside world. Okay, if institutions in the outside world are dominated by leftists and liberals, it would make sense that people who are not on the left would have a few bones to pick with the powers that be. Fascist organizations will derive much energy from narratives of grievance focused on specific outgroups. Anyone with an in-group identity is going to derive much energy from a narrative of grievance against outgroups. It's nothing unique to fascists. Feelings of frustration and oppression, in other words, being human, everyone has these feelings, Feelings of being excluded and disregarded, right? Everyone has these feelings. Feelings of being deprived of one's manifest rights and recognitions. Everyone has these feelings, right? Represent a potent set of negative emotions. Yeah, everyone has these feelings. Every in-group has these feelings. And for good reasons, too. Gurus will often rely on narratives of grievance pertaining to themselves and their potential followers to drive engagement. A worldview in which all is essentially fair and just is not one that will encourage people to search for alternative ways to view the world. Correct, but if you have reasons for grievance, all right, then you'd probably be, be incentivized to get the in-group power and energy that comes from nurturing those grievances. Right? Gru gurus often engage in personal grievance narratives. They provide emotional connection and sympathy for the guru. They provide a convenient explanation for why someone, their unique talents has not been well supported or given their recognition they deserve by the outside world. All right, sometimes, this is with good basis, and sometimes it's with a fatuous basis, as with Brett and Eric Weinstein. Uh, gurus relate to conspiratorial ideation, explaining why their special ideas and perspectives are not being recognized and accepted by the outside world, because their ideas are being suppressed by malevolent and powerful actors for selfish reasons. Well, often ideas and perspectives and individuals are suppressed by outside powerful actors for their own reasons, right? Every form of in-group identity including every form of nationalisms, inculcates victimization, right? The stronger you believe in Islam or Christianity or Judaism or the gay lifestyle, right? The stronger you believe that the world outside your in-group is a nefarious place. The stronger your in-group identity, the more likely you are to see the negative in out-groups. So you really can't enjoy a strong in-group identity without taking on culty vibes or ties bind and blind. That's Jonathan Haidt. So this center-left secular show decoding the gurus is inherently suspicious of strong in-group identity but life for most people is better off with a strong in-group identity so the grometer essentially says a high score on the grometer is bad it refers to potentially exploitive gurus who produce ersatz wisdom meaning a corrupt epistemics that creates the appearance of useful knowledge but has none of the substance well you know who can't be exploited this way someone who doesn't love someone who lacks ties Someone who doesn't have in-group loyalties, right? To love is to be vulnerable. To be tied to other people is to be vulnerable. Most people don't want to live without love, right? A life without love is not a particularly high-functioning one. So the grometer notes, a heightened sense of how the world is not right and how it ought to be fixed and that the gurus are the persons to do it is a common feature. The broader public fails to recognize their genius and fails to heed their advice. Thus, the world lurches from calamity to calamity. So gurus often position themselves as a Cassandra, warning of possible calamities that can be avoided if only their advice is heeded. And the followers gain a role for themselves in supporting, defending, and promoting the guru. They can help make the world a better place. Well, those out of power are more likely to believe that something's wrong with the world. Right? That is only common sense. If your group lacks power, if your institutions in your society are dominated by people with a hostile perspective on your in-group, Right. You have very rational and empirical reasons to believe that the world around you is not right. 
given that most American institutions are dominated by the left, why would non-leftists be at ease with the current power structure? Guru, the Gurometer says, gurus are greatly attracted to claiming they have developed game-changing and paradigm-shifting intellectual products. Well, given that the left largely controls the intellectual means of production, why would someone not on the left not seek out game-changing and paradigm-shifting intellectual products? Right? Decoding the gurus wants us to engage primarily on the basis of epistemics. How do we know what we know? But this disengaged, reflexive, buffered, rationalistic perspective on life is a modern, secular, liberal, leftist one. It's very different from how traditionalists experience life. And we all have our subjective hero systems. It's just that people on the left, like the host of Decoding the Gurus, seem to believe that they have transcended hero systems, that they are just sharing objective truths. Scientific expertise. Sure. I'm not sure that that's the same. But I mean, even if you react. say, I don't believe that it's intelligent design, it's not about God, but well, is there Michael something, is there something I mean, else? But I don't think scientists design. agree with him that there are big gaps in the theory right, of evolution. Right, right, right. Right. He but, essentially is putting God in the process or implying that God's in the process. So right. if you bring Michael Behe on, and the evolutionary scientists are going to be extremely upset. Yeah, and that's sure. right. Because the mistake, the mistake yeah. he made was to talk to the devil. Right. Uh, so a, a principle in my book is follow the sacredness, and around it you'll find a ring of motivated ignorance. And <laughs> evolution is a really contested issue. It's in place front and center in Chris's book. And there are some quacks out there who claim to be scientists. You know, he is not a respected scientist. No. So you, you basically committed treason by even just talking to him. Oh. You have to know where the fault lines are, where the third rails are, and you touched one. Wait a second, but I want to ask you, I want to ask you a question. No, let, 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 let's play this out in real time. I have a rule on my show. We don't have climate denialists on my show. We just don't do it. I'm interested in lots of exchange on a lot of issues, as I think the show makes clear. We have people with all sorts of perspectives. We even have Maggie Gallagher on, who is a strong mm -hmm. opponent of marriage equality, and there's some people who didn't like that. But I draw the line, for whatever reason, I draw to climate denialism. And, 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 and if I had, was forced to articulate why I draw the line there, I would say because a, it's extremely dangerous, right? Because it's undermining this 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 scientific consensus that I think is absolutely necessary to um, us avoiding massive, widespread global immiseration. Uh, and I don't want to have any role in, in fomenting that. Now, there's a certain degree to which that is antithetical to the spirit of free inquiry, right? If you mm -hmm. if you caricaturize it as talking the devil. Mm -hmm. But the thing I want to ask you, John, which I asked you during the break, is like, in, in order for you to have this whole conversation, right, you're putting yourself at this kind of remove, mm -hmm. right? You say, well, you people, they have their sacredness. But the whole point is that everybody's embedded in that same framework, but right? To, to varying degrees. So my whole life, I was a partisan liberal. And I got, I, I switched over from studying cultural variation and morality to political variation in order to help the Democrats, because they kept screwing up. Gore and Kerry had no idea how to connect. So I switched over. I was still part of the team. And in doing the research for the book, I realized, oh my God, conservatives, I'm sort of the Burkean conservatives, the, not the authoritarians, the Burke, the, they're right about a lot of things about how to make a good society. So once I stepped out of the team, and I'm no longer a liberal, I'm now a centrist, um, Sure, I'm part of something. Sure, you I are. Can see, I can think a lot more. No, but see, but this is what drives me crazy. No, this is what drives me crazy. The, the, it's it's the claim to special enlightenment that centrists have that drive me crazy. Because I, no, I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm being totally honest with you. Because the point is that we're all embedded. So when you you will see the Washington Post editorial page or, or Thomas Friedman or all sorts of bien pensant, uh, you know, thinkers of of, 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 of centrism. And the, the fact of the matter is that is as ideologically binding and as sort of no, team oriented as as. No, it's a matter of degree. You're right that nobody is fully objective, but it's a matter of degree. And if you are on the floor, if you're a congressman, I mean, you are now you're fighting sure. every day. You yes. cannot think clearly. Right, right, right. if you're an academic? who is less liberal than before, sure, I'm not objective, but I'm more objective than I was five years ago. But there's, are you there's an impulse among centrists. A lot of them are psychologically liberal. They want to be yeah. different. They want to get noticed. There's, oh, hey, over here. And so then I'll attack my own. And so right. there's actually a lot of that going on. These people are actually probably the kind of people uh, who would naturally be liberal, but they also want a distinction. I'm not saying that about you, but I'm saying that there's no, a lot of that true, going on. It's true. Okay, well, it's true. The best you can do, the best you can find, because it's very hard to find. Well, gas flies are valuable up to a point, but then at some point it becomes its own. Well, here's my question. Here's my question for you. There's a lot of that out there. For you and for John as people, because then the question is, the big question Question, and the, and the, the huge question that, 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 that pertains to both the work that we do here and, and whether we're going to solve global, global climate change and the possibility of moral transformation and moral revolution, which is something that Kwame Anthony Appiah has written about, very, I think, very well, is how can people change, right? I mean, what is the process? And John, you're someone who I think has had real changes, real evolution in your thoughts, particularly, I think, even just institutionally in the... Okay, so let's try to go beyond this enlightenment perspective. Let's look back to philosopher Ronnie Goodman's work in progress, conservative claims of cultural oppression on the nature and origins of conservophobia. So people like those in this TV discussion on MSNBC, part of the liberal elite, they believe they stand above a retrograde conservatism. So they believe that their enlightenment ideals liberate them from the various hero systems to which conservatives remain beholden. But they don't understand that their own liberal left enlightened perspective is just another hero system, right? Hero systems are systems of social meaning, all right? 
liberals see conservatives as compromised by some kind of primitive attraction to the relics of benighted pre-modernity. Now, the conservative perspective is that liberalism is itself a hero system in disguise, a subjective hero system that stays concealed behind this secular facade of enlightenment, pragmatism, and utilitarianism. So liberals see themselves as just promoting flourishing, right? promoting ordinary human fulfillment, shorn of any higher metaphysical aspirations. But conservatives see that liberalism is itself a religious impulse right, stemming from Protestantism and a spiritual ideal that now plays itself out through the medium of these ostensibly secular goals. So liberalism is a hero system that fills itself and disguises itself as the transcendence of all hero systems. So what was the Enlightenment all about? Part of it was a great belief in the power of reason. And as I keep saying, I see reason as a weak read compared to the power of genetics and the power of incentives and the power of imprinting. Another key part of the Enlightenment is a belief that people are basically good. Right? All right-wing perspectives on the world begin with the assumption that people are not basically good. Pretty much all left-wing perspectives on the world begin with the assumption that people are basically good. Teams you were associated with, you were identified as a conservative, you had, you know, were at a conservative think tank, and now I don't think identifying those terms anymore are not institutionally affiliated with that team. And my question is, what, what hope is there for the process of that kind of change if the kind of psychological mechanisms you're writing about are there? You have to approach it indirectly. You're not going to reason people uh, into, into agreement or even into discussion. Do the part about Dale Carnegie. <laughs> I think this is a very important You argument. can't reason people if you push their mo right, yeah, most important right, right, what, what, what you have to do is you have to try to foster relationships. So as, you know, as, as Beach said, you know, we, relationships open our minds and open our hearts. This is the reverend we just talked to, Jasmine Bishwara, right. who's making that point. So, for point. example, there's a group uh, called livingroomconversations.org, and they try to, you get a, a liberal and a conservative who are friends, who know each other, there are still some out there, pairs, you get them to have a dinner party, you bring people together, and it's, it's important to share food. So if you do indirect methods, you take advantage of our, 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 the social judgments come first, then the reasoning comes after. If we want to reach agreement, it's going to be by bringing people together in good circumstances. Uh, and the chat says, didn't Freud usher in the idea to moderns that man still does not act uh, rationally? I, I think that was an argument that Freud made. Isn't uh, Freud the basis of all modern market research? No. I don't know a lot of things about modern market research. I can assure you that uh, Freudian theorizing is not the basis of all modern market uh, research. So let me go back here to Ronnie Goldman's decoding on conservative claims of cultural oppression. So Liberals understand modernity as separated from pre-modernity by the Enlightenment, which launched in the 17th and 18th century, that uh, we've moved through different civilizations. So the pre-modern, pre-Enlightenment Europeans are not just ignorant and superstitious, right? They were much more animal-like, according to this perspective. They were given to a kind of spontaneity and emotion that would be considered abnormal today. Right. They believed in sacred and profane spiritual forces all around them. So they didn't believe in the Buffett identity. They believed in the porous identity, meaning that these spiritual forces, either for good or for ill, you know, angels and demons all around them, could have a profound effect on their life. So from a modern perspective, these pre-moderns were ignorant and unruly. They lacked the inhibitions that we now associate with civilization, and they didn't have a clear sense of boundaries between the mind and the body. And the enlightened modern liberal, right, sees that uh, we can make our own way through the power of religion and uh, through the power of reason, that uh, reasons become the new religion. And so we can even change our sex. We're not limited to the biology of the sex that we were born into. So from a liberal perspective, we can use reason to gain self-possession, self-control, and self-transparency. We can liberate ourselves from the illusions of the past. But this self-congratulatory enlightenment narrative conceals a darker story where liberals use molding and coercion and bullying and power to force their hero system on everybody else. So liberals believe they're holding up autonomous self-possession, but really this is just the internalizing of the new restraints and inhibitions of this new secular religion. Right. Liberals see reason as something that we can just choose, as something predominantly conscious and disembodied, right? operating effectively without respect to our body. 
and this leaves them insensible to the layer of human experience that resides in the body, that resides in our ways of, of being, that uh, occur prior to us developing reasoning. So liberals are dramatically overconfident of their ability to recognize and overcome oppression and inequality. Uh, where they can actually open their minds. And also realizing that people are not convinced when they feel attacked. And right. Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People sounds a little corny now, but actually it's very, it, it's very useful today if you get past the slightly archaic language in that you talk to people, you try to figure out what's going on in their minds. Imagine. Do I find talking to most women boring? Uh, I mean, no more than I find talking to most men. I mean, I really enjoy my opportunities just to be around only men, but I enjoy most of my interactions with women in my life as well. Luke needs to stay out of the Chris Hayes zone. Latest Steve Saylor post on narrative collision. Is it too hot for YouTube? Yeah, let's go to the latest Steve Saylor post was excellent. I put it on my list of things to talk about. All right, we've got a Muslim arrested in Brooklyn for murdering a gay black man. How three different news outlets covered the story. So we've got this trend, Middle East immigrants to the U.S., mostly Muslims, but also Armenians, objecting to the establishment, pushing the gay and trans agenda. Sometimes these immigrants do this admirably through the parents' rights movement. Sometimes they do it despicably through street violence. So for the mainstream media pushing the Democratic Party line, this immigrant versus LGBTQ stuff is tricky because it raises questions about the inherent tensions in the Democratic coalition of the fringes grand strategy. So on the other hand, a gay was murdered in a hate crime, a black gay. So the story is too unnarrative to not push it heavily. But the stabber is a Muslim teen whose friends objected to the gay display as offensive to Islam. So that is off narrative. Now, the usual media hope is that the stabber must be some kind of Archie Bunker character, and you hope the public doesn't pry too much into the facts. So we've got the Daily Mail, a frequent purveyor of facts, and we've got the New York Times and the Washington Post, and how do they handle the story? So the Daily Mail says dancer O'Shea Sibley shown voguing at a Brooklyn gas station before being stabbed to death by a 17-year-old Muslim suspect in an anti-gay hate crime. So that's how the Daily Mail begins it, all right? They put the fact that Stabber is a Muslim in the headline. In the New York Times, they try to bury the role of Islam down into the 11th paragraph and then immediately wish it away by saying this has nothing to do with, you know, true Islam. And in the Washington Post, today, 19th paragraph article on the arrest of the Muslim youth that goes on and on about anti-gay hate crimes, yet never mentions a single thing about the killer being a Muslim. Right, this is uh, Chris Mooney talking about the Republican brand. Three months now, uh, there is no serious scientific criticism of anything that I've said, okay? It's just politically controversial, but scientifically it's actually not. Uh, and in it, I cite a large body of scientific research, and I've tweeted twice today uh, using the hashtags, you should be able to find it, a link to a bunch of papers from my blog where you can go and start to read some of the science yourself. I mean, if you're interested in this stuff, you're free thinking, critically thinking people, I know you are. You don't have to take my word for it. You can go read the published peer reviewed research on the differences between liberals and conservatives yourself. And I only listed 11 genetic studies and eight brain uh, and physiological studies. It's just a tiny bit of what's actually out there because the, the most studies are in psychology, not in genetics, not in, not in neuroscience. They're in psychology. I didn't even list those. But anyway, it can just get you started reading this stuff so you can know it's real. It's not made up. The scientists did it. It's not my fault. It's their fault. All right. The upshot is that I used to really, really misunderstand the people who disagree with me. I did not get what makes them tick. And in fact, as a liberal, I'm a moderate liberal. I'm not as liberal as, as some. But as a liberal, I used to think what a lot of liberals think about their opponents. I thought that the reason they were coming at it differently than I was was that either they were driven by religion, on the one hand, or they were driven by money and self-interest, on the other hand. So if you wanted to understand why conservatives are acting the way they do, you'd either do this old journalistic trick called follow the money. In other words, figure out who's funding them. Is it ExxonMobil? Is it the Koch brothers? What have you. Or follow the religion, which is kind of the same thing. Figure out what the religious rights role in this is. And there's often big money actually supporting the religious right as well. And that was sort of the approach taken in my 2005, my first book, 
It was called the Republican War on Science, and it played a kind of central role in defining this whole idea that there's a unique right-wing problem with science, with, with fact. All right? So I want to start the story there, because I've learned a lot since then. It's not the Republican War on Science was wrong, but its analysis was sort of incomplete. Okay, so we'll go back to 2005. Okay, so Ronnie Goodman takes a few shots at uh, this book, and the dominant, uh, you know, Enlightenment liberal perspective. So, to be on the bottom left, all right, you don't recognize meaning as something that primarily exists outside of yourself, such as in religion or in community or in nation, right? You believe that meaning is something that we can create just in our own heads, right? So people. In a traditional perspective or a conservative perspective, we see meaning as something that primarily occurs through our interactions with people outside of ourselves, that there is meaning in the world outside of us. The liberal left perspective is that meaning is something we just create in our heads. All right, so you've got the dominant modern perspective, could be called enlightenment naturalism, right? Moral legitimacy just uh, refers to empirical evidence about the human condition. Now, conservatives assign a much deeper meaning to human anatomy. And so from a liberal left perspective, they are engaging in an ancient temptation. They are surrendering to the power of biology, and they are attributing to sexual anatomy a significance that it does not truly have. Whatever anatomy people are born with, they can transcend through the power of their reason and their choice. All right? So People on the liberal left have a much greater ability in a belief in the ability of individuals through the power of reason to create strategic autonomous lives where they can transcend their biology or any other uh, shortcoming. And so liberals see the prejudice against trans by conservatives as a failure of enlightenment and a symptom of some kind of irrational hatred and a symbol of prejudice that uh, people on the right have failed to transcend their ordinary embodied perceptions. They haven't reached that highest state of spiritual purity and freedom, haven't adopted the sort of emotional asceticism that enables this kind of transcendence. So liberals believe that there should be this kind of transcendence of the body as well in history. Historian Rick Perlstein argues liberalism is rooted in this notion of the enlightenment, that we can use our reason and we can use the facts that our reason accumulates and we can sort out what is true and we can use the scientific method to arrive at a consensus view of what is true, right? While the right-wing view of truth is based on tribal identification and myths and hero systems. Well, the conservative critique of this is that the liberal perspective is also a subjective hero system. So people on the left love the Galileo story, that Galileo was persecuted by the church. But in reality, the Galileo story is far less dramatic than the liberal myth, right? It's much more in accord with what is happening today. Right? Galileo's suffering was because of rivalry, jealousy, and vindictiveness from other scientists and philosophers, which is frequently the lot of people in modern times. So anyone who believes that inquisitions went out with the triumph of secularism over religion not paid attention to the records of foundations, research agencies, professional societies, and academic institutions and departments. So people on the right and the left, they want to make cognitive and ideological culture wars, but they are really a clash of conflicting subjective hero systems. Right? And we, we develop a hero system usually from our community. Right? It's, it's largely unstructured, it's usually not articulated explicitly, but it just shows up in our lives. It's, it's the background against which we act. It's the meaning outside of ourselves against which we measure ourselves. So people on the liberal left, they want to adjudicate between liberalism and conservatism on the basis of ideas, on the basis of epistemics, in terms of agreements and disagreements about what is true and what makes sense. But the clash is really one that goes much deeper to our very bodies and to the way that we approach the world, which from a traditional conservative perspective is we encounter the world primarily not as individuals, not as strategic, autonomous, buffered, reflexive individuals, but as members of tribes, as members of communities, and that we receive cues 
about the subjective hero systems that we subscribe to from the people around us, from our tribe and community. So conservatives have not internalized this buffered, distant, reflexive, you know, reason-based, autonomous understanding of the human being. Right? People on the right see humans not primarily as individuals, but as members of, of tribes, and that we get meaning from our connection with our tribe. So for those who control the cultural means of production, conservatives have effectively been judged unfit for life off the reservation, unable to function in a truly human environment because they have not internalized the inner ordering impulses of the liberal autonomous strategic buffet identity, which is now considered what it means to be properly civilized. So from a liberal left perspective, conservatives are seen as coarse and squalid animals and peasants. They are outsiders who must be denied entry to the courtly halls of liberalism with all its false airs and empty refinements. Here's the book. And at the outset, I'd like to disclose to all my audiences, we're not trying to echo the cover image of another popular book that was out at the same time. So we, you know, we only noticed that later. The, the argument of my book <laughs> was more complex. And <laughs> in it, what I, what I claimed was that under the administration of George W. Bush, our last president, scientific knowledge was under attack uh, on global warming, on stem cell research, on evolution, and on and on and on. I think if you want to kind of capture the ethos of the George W. Bush era, uh, then I think it's pretty well captured in a quotation that he gave, actually, to a reporter following the, the 2004 devastating tsunami killed so many people in uh, Pacific Rim countries and uh, the Indian Ocean area. Everybody remembers the Christmas tsunami of 2004 and the just terrible disaster. And Bush was giving a press conference, and a journalist asked him a sort of scientific question. Uh, and the question was, Mr. President, does the United States have a warning system in place to protect us from tsunamis you know, here at home? And Bush had no earthly idea whether we did or not. He was completely clueless. But he tried to answer. He sort of hemmed and hawed. And he finally started to say something scientific in response. He started to say, well, you know, I think we might be less vulnerable than other parts of the world to tsunamis. But then, as he quickly added, I am not a geologist, as you know. And I think that sort of is the Bush administration on science in sort of a nutshell. So things... Okay, so people on the liberal left, they want to contest things on the basis, essentially, of epistemology. And they will look at right-wing claims as epistemology epistemologically deficient, right? But these claims constitute a countercultural assault against the liberal lens. It's an effort to articulate what lies underneath this epistemological fragment of man, reveal the latter as a derivation upon something much more primordial, which cannot be primarily understood in epistemological terms. This is the subjective hero system that we all have, right? The cosmological orientation is a fancier word for hero system. So liberals cannot understand conservative claims of cultural oppression because the very structure of their liberal identity inures them to this human constant and that conservatives are defending one hero system against another, resisting the disciplines and repressions of the liberal buffered identity in favor of an earlier, more pre-modern form of consciousness that sees the world as a more magical and enchanted place. Another key part of the conservative worldview is much more ease with a homogeneous culture. Right. Pre-modern cultures were homogeneous. Traditionalists are much more at ease with the ideas of homogeneous cultures. Modern people tend to prefer pluralism. So in ancient culture, right, the, the moral and the spiritual was seen as just as real as stones, rivers, and mountains. Right? People didn't lead abstract, intellectualized lives. All right? So that uh, the, the fetus was, was a living baby, all right, was just seen as obviously true. So conservatives reject the kind of edited speech, the expressive moderation, the intellectualizing of life by liberals. All right, liberals see themselves as neutral. They see their prescriptions as coming logically from the perspective of the strategic, autonomous, reflexive identity. Right? They, they see themselves purged of anthropocentric contamination. They see themselves as purged from traditional religious contamination. So enlightenment believes people are basically good, that people can transform themselves to become autonomous through the power of reason. And so liberals tend to attack those parts of human nature that don't sit easily with this preferred basket of liberal values. 
that uh, stands in the way of this ethos of disengaged self-control and self-reflexivity, meaning constantly monitoring yourself. So liberalism has the agenda to transform people into good universalist discipline to uproot every last trace of aggression and insensitivity, replace this with enlightenment, awareness, and altruism. So there was an incident at Vassar College where the assistant dean of students ventured that several male students had just been exonerated of false accusations of rape, not the worse off for their ideal, because the ideal had offered them an opportunity for self-exploration that they would otherwise not have had. So the false accusations were redeemed by the self-exploration they facilitated. So you see a feminism here that stands in opposition not just to rape, but everything in human nature that might possibly precipitate rape, such as human beings not being basically good, that uh, men have higher testosterone levels than women, that men are much more aggressive, including sexually aggressive than women. They want to reject that. So this dean thought it would have been great if these students would have taken this opportunity to expose and extirpate any last impulse that they had towards natural, primeval, ape-like behavior. So liberals don't believe in the code of the gentleman, right? They, they don't generally believe in getting our moral code from religion or tradition, right? They think it's something that we should be after reason toward uh, taking direction from you know, our, our best and brightest, those who went to Harvard and the like, right? They believe that we can elevate ourselves through this transformative power of reason. The non-liberal believes that we are embedded in in bodies that lust, that uh, have a will for power and aggression, that uh, people are not basically good and cannot be transformed for the good just by the power of reason. Things under Bush were bad when it, when it comes to science. Uh, and this is what I was writing about, and it was a bestseller, and it, it drew a lot of attention, sent me out on the road to talk about it, and I was explaining why. I was explaining why science was so messed up under Bush. And the kind of story I was telling was a story that I would describe as being political in nature and being environmental in nature. In other words, I was doing what a political journalist often does. Right? And political just means I was following the money, you know, the money trail. Environmental, I don't... Okay, so this is how Ronnie Goodman describes Chris Mooney's book, The Republican Brain, an intriguing physiological explanation for why conservatives are less disposed than liberals towards this kind of buffered, expressive moderation. So he says, MRI studies reveal that conservatives tend to have a larger right amygdala which is the evolutionarily more ancient part of the brain that tends to generate immediate fight or flight responses to threatening stimuli, and that liberals tend to possess more gray matter in the anterior cingulate cortex, the ACC, which is a newer part of our evolutionary system that suspends automatic responses to assess facts and to detect errors. So he argues that conservatives tend to be more instinctive and given to immediate reflex actions, that liberals are more reflective and cognitive, that they are better able to suspend automatic fear responses to undertake a more careful evaluation of facts. So the ideology of conservatives comes from their physiology. Every human, like every animal, possesses a fear system capable of rapid-fire defensive reactions, but that system appears to be stronger and more predominant among conservatives. So when people are offered alcohol, for example, alcohol shifts us to the right politically. Right? It correlates with more expression of right-wing views, even among self-described liberals. The people's cognitive architecture is perhaps more consistent with conservative ideology. That is the way our brains are built. So conservatism may well represent the more natural human and animal state, which tends to get more suppressed among liberals. So the disinhibiting effects of alcohol temporarily reset liberals closer to the default setting, which evolutionarily older rapid fire reactions you know, overwhelm the ACC, the anterior cingulate cortex. So tough on crime, strongly pro-military conservatives have a more pronounced startle reflex. They exhibit greater skin conductance, right? Uh, nervous system arousal when shown threatening images, say of maggots or a large spider. People with measurably lower physical sensitivities to sudden noise and threatening vis visible images were more likely to support left-wing policies. I don't mean, you know, in the sense of writing about clean air and clean water. I mean, I was attributing 
what Republicans were doing with science, not to something inherent about who they are, in other words, their nature, their core being, their, you know, their identity. I was rather attributing it to the political environment in which all of this happens and in which they have to get ahead or, get, or fall behind their political opponents. Uh, in other words, the bad behavior with respect to science I was claiming was emerging from the political ecosystem that existed in the way politics existed. And so I would say, you know, this is a conservative movement that's grown up over the past several decades. It grew up for particular historical reasons. Uh, it came to encompass the religious right, but also corporate interests. And once that became what the movement was and how it was constituted, politicians, in order to get elected, had to appeal to those interests. They had to appeal to the religious right. They had to appeal to the big Exxon Mobiles of the world. Okay? And those groups didn't like science. So of course Republican politicians said what those groups wanted them to say. And voila, you have the Bush administration and all of its anti-science behavior, this storm of science abuse and denial. That was the argument then. All right? Okay, so Chris Mooney makes the case that uh, Republican or conservative reactions are much more instinctual, while those of people on the left are much more considered. And so because conservatives are incentivized to follow their followers' motivated cognition, all right, it's rarer among conservatives who have pro-authority biases to you know, pick on their own. The conservatives tend to be more unified and supportive of their political team. Conservatives are less willing to pick a fight with their friends, less likely to issue a corrective when they need to issue one, less motivated to step out of rank and call out bogus assertions. By contrast, he argues liberals care little for obedience and group solidarity because they are children of the Enlightenment. They don't bow to authority or pledge allegiance to the team. So this is why liberals remain allied with scientists who aren't just going to put up with any nonsense in their fields of expertise. So liberals and scientists are usually on the same side of the issues because liberals have an open personality with its curiosity, tolerance, and flexibility, and that naturally disposes them toward the scientific method compelling a respect for scientists that is less common among conservatives. Conservatives routinely dismiss science and expertise, but it's hard physiologically for liberals to buck what scientists say and to withstand the intellectual beating that is sure to follow if they do. Conservatives have comparatively closed personalities, and so that lands them in overwhelming conflict with the conclusions of modern science on a wide range of issues. This is why there's a wide expertise gap between liberals and conservatives in the modern world. And to try to close this gap, conservatives now foster their own counter-expertise to thwart mainstream knowledge. The conservatives have seceded from the common reality occupied by liberals and independents. They now have their own truth, their own experts to spout it, their own communication channels, their own newspapers, cable networks, talk radio shows, blogs, encyclopedias, think tanks, even universities. And they all operate in the service of the belief, affirmation, ideological activation that drives conservatives which is all about essentially legitimating the promptings of their amygdalas as rational responses to bedrock truth. Liberals have their own neurologically driven physiological needs to satisfy, but these include the need for cognition, the need for accuracy, the need to distinguish oneself from others and to stand out to be unique rather than part of the herd. So liberals are attached to their core values emotionally. These values just happen to include the enlightenment belief that if you can't get the facts right, you can't solve the problem and make the world better. Enlightenment convictions have also kept liberals from truly understanding conservatives. Was that account wrong? My answer is incomplete. The basic story has clearly got something going for it. Because this is a recent study that came out in the American Sociological Review in which a guy named Gordon Goshot actually tried to test the Republican war on science hypothesis scientifically. And it was, it's really great as a journalist to see someone say, you know, we set out to test the hypothesis of Mooney 2005. All right, so it's like, oh, I'm in the literature. Uh, and what he found was that if you look at people's trust in institutions in America, uh, one of the institutions is science. All right? And the trust in institutions has been declining across the board. But trust in science has been declining much more among conservatives, the red line, than it has been declining among liberals or among moderates, the other two lines. So Goshat said Mooney was right. This is a unique conservative phenomenon. And then he went on to give an environmental account, just of the sort that I've described. Uh, but he did this even as I was starting to question whether that was really the right reason. I mean, definitely conservatives have a problem with science. But is, is it just this historical, political story, or is it something deeper than that? The problem is that the environmental story ignores the psychology of politics, what we know about the psychology of people who are conservative versus liberal. And we know a lot about it. And over time, I began to suspect, as I was watching more and more attacks on science coming from the right and how conservatives behave, that we needed to pull in that component of the story. Uh, so let me tell you how I started to realize that this was important. I became first. Okay, that's going to do it for now. Take care. Bye-bye.